No, we started, as I say, in 1981. We started with uh, empty minds, as it were. Um, we started with the, regarding uh, Memphis as a clean slate. There had been some work done at the site uh, previously, notably by Petrie, uh, and in the 1950s by uh, the University <coughs> of Pennsylvania, and back just before the, and during the First World War, uh, by Clarence Fisher, also from um, Philadelphia. But really, compared with other capitals, whether they're local, known provincial capitals, or national capitals like Thebes, uh, virtually nothing, it has to be said, uh, had been done in the way of field uh, exploration, uh, physical investigative archaeology uh, at the site. So although it was exciting, it wasn't a total uh, surprise to find that there are many uh, figures uh, involved in past work and uh, investigation uh, of Memphis that uh, are not only not household names, but are barely known today. Uh, I see that there's a book by Jeffreys, um, if any copies are left, um, uh, on, the, uh, on the book stand, which has recently come out, um, uh, which is uh, my attempt to uh, collate and uh, present uh, some of the more useful um, sources for uh, past exploration uh, of uh, uh, Memphis. Um, but I've given pride of place to a character uh, that you may have heard about before, but if you have, it's probably from me, called Joseph Hekekian. Uh, and the Hekekian papers are uh, a major resource, not just because of their quantity, but their, well, because of their quality as well, are a major resource for the, uh, the history and natural topography and artificial topography uh, of the site. And uh, just to give you a flavour of uh, what Hekekian is producing, um, I, it's worth just pointing out, I think, that he is, as far as I know, the world's first geoarchaeologist, or the first person to uh, combine his geographical skills, knowledge, and experience with uh, archaeological data. So the sort of thing that he's uh, uh, turning out uh, is well exemplified by uh, this. This is uh, those of you who've been to Mitrahino will perhaps remember the uh, uh, prostate, uh, the horizontal. <laughs> Horizontal. <laughs> you can see him wincing. <laughs> the uh, the uh, uh, recumbent uh, castle statue of, uh, of Ramses II uh, in the uh, in the museum there at the moment. Uh, that was found not by Hecatian but by Joseph uh, Cavilia in the uh, 1820s. But what Hecatian did do was to locate. Pedestal uh, that the Colossus had been on, and what he did do even further, which is greatly addressed to us, is conduct geological coring uh, in and around and beneath the uh, uh, location uh, of the pedestal. So he's combining, as I say, he's combining his geological uh, skills with uh, archaeological data. And although people like uh, Letius, perhaps uh, Jefferson in the United States, had done this in a very sort of uh, rudimentary way. This was the first. This is the first time that we get a proper uh, 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 expert uh, involvement of geology and archaeology. Uh, this is his uh, uh, geological map, or one of them, uh, of uh, the Memphite region. That's Mitradino. You can see how much smaller that was than in the 1850s. We're going back to the early 1850s now uh, than it was in the 1950s. Uh, and what he did was exactly what we've been doing, inspired by him in a sense, uh, is, uh, was to conduct, to uh, drill um, cores right across the site, and all over the site, and indeed across the river towards, uh, towards Helwan, uh, where that, uh, that important early dynastic cemetery, which Hikekin didn't know about at the time, uh, but where, where that is located. And uh, just to give you a, a, a sample of uh, the kind of recording he's leaving behind, this is his uh, fair copy uh, of his diary. Uh, and luckily all in English, because he was trained in uh, Britain from, uh, from his uh, early teens until he was called to Egypt. Uh, and this is a particularly interesting um, site that he records. Um, it's uh, right on the eastern side of the site, so he's showing us geological and architectural sections and plan of something that he initially 
uh, uh, thought was and described as the Memphite Nilometer, the Nile gauge that was used to measure the uh, advance and retreat of the, the Nile floodwaters. Uh, very celebrated in several classical sources, um, not Herodotus, you know, probably wasn't there then, uh, but certainly Diodorus, Strabo, Heliodorus, and others um, uh, referred to the uh, uh, Memphis Nilometer uh, and to the fact that the figure for plenitude for a perfect Nile at Memphis, 16 cubits, uh, was the official figure for the, for the whole of the country. So, a uh, hugely important site, if indeed it had been the Nilometer. We don't think it was, but we do think that the Kekin was here uh, dealing with uh, a section of the Roman riverside wall at Memphis and following his incredibly precise uh, dimensions and instructions and directions, um, we were able to uh, relocate in the early years of the survey, able to relocate part uh, of, that, uh, of that riverside wall. And something alongside it, uh, which is also not what the Kekin records, we don't think, uh, but which looks for all the world like a Roman nymphaeum or water shrine uh, built out from the, uh, the river wall itself. Okay, so back to the main site. Um, uh, those early years were spent uh, uh, routinely recording uh, standing remains uh, and uh, levels, floor levels of temples such as the, the main west gate of the Temple of Ptah here, with the um, uh, colonnades, part of the hypostyle hall behind it, uh, just, just to sort of uh, flag up how much of the site was gone, compare the hypostyle hall at Memphis with the hypostyle hall at Karnak, for example, and uh, you can see you know, how, how little we have left to, uh, to work with. Uh, I've mentioned the sense of urgency that we have about the site, not only because of the uh, rampant building that is going on all around, but also the fact that uh, all exposed stone architecture is at serious risk from a rising water table and uh, salt efflorescence on the surface, um, which has that kind of result. Mm -hmm. That was excavated in the 1970s and was in pristine condition at the time, uh, Cathal Head Column Capital in, in situ, uh, but left exposed and now simply rotting away, as you can see. So, I mentioned some of the uh, techniques that we have at our disposal. Um, uh, another one is uh, uh, ground based remote sensing. We've had a, a flavour of this already. Uh, you have uh, also. Uh, gathered, anybody who saw Sarah Parkett's program will uh, appreciate uh, what can be done using satellite imagery and particularly infrared technology. Uh, although disappointingly what that program seems to have left out, at least the bits of it that I saw, uh, is the ground-based work, the very intensive and uh, labour-intensive and very detailed and precise uh, ground-based remote sensing uh, that people like uh, Matheson here, my colleague, now sadly deceased, um, have been doing over the years, um, uh, just as, as useful, if not more so, because of the resolution is that much better uh, than what you can obtain using existing and uh, pre-ordered uh, satellite imagery. Uh, and sediment coring has been mentioned. Uh, this has been one of our um, uh, uh, most cost-effective uh, and productive uh, techniques. Uh, clearly doesn't provide you with much of a window, but it, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it gives you a snapshot of uh, what is going on uh, below ground level and is of minimum, uh, minimum disturbance, minimum uh, uh, destruction of the, the archaeological material. Uh, and sometimes we get uh, unexpected results, or expected results that we only half expected. Uh, we're actually looking here, I'm sure you've seen this before, uh, we're looking at the uh, throne room of, of Memnetta, uh, successor to Ramesses II, um, with some bits of columns still visible amongst the uh, ponds and, and rushes. Uh, and this takes us back to Clarence Fisher's uh, excavations that I mentioned, where he notes that, uh, as far as he could tell, the entire palace structure of the uh, uh, of Memnetta. Uh, was built on virgin soil, virgin land. It hadn't been used for uh, building before. 
And together with everything else that we were um, um, uh, accumulating, all the other information we were accumulating at the time, this got us thinking in a very focused way about the environment, the river, the way that the river might have moved, the way that the city might have moved in uh, response uh, to changing uh, conditions in the valley. And so we started uh, concentrating on these sediment cores. Uh, it's not the only you know, way of, uh, of uh, uh, recovering the information that we've, we've used, uh, but as I say, it certainly has been very valuable. Um, we also, uh, we do um, um, not spend too much time on this, we also decided at one point that uh, we could go very much further without a, uh, an area excavation um, to uh, test the uh, ideas that we were, we were gathering. So we chose a uh, small site uh, in the southwest quadrant of the room field. Uh, we can call it RAT purposely. <laughs> it just happened to be the next alphabetic uh, code that, uh, that uh, was in our uh, list of site, site uh, uh, descriptions. And this is the New Kingdom uh, configuration. Site is here, here, and on in that corner, um, a passageway through the existing buildings to the silos, and we think stone uh, uh, doorways to these larger properties in the east, looking west here, um, which uh, probably belonged to the priesthood of the, of the Tar Temple. A very different configuration that's in the New Kingdom, very different configuration in the late Middle Kingdom, uh, Second Intermediate Period, totally different plan, uh, totally different orientation, uh, the two separated out by a thick sand uh, layer, which was a surprise. Um, uh, so uh, <coughs> an entirely different sort of phasing to the site. But as you can see, the architecture is well preserved, and this is a point I want to make, that settlement sites in Egypt are not a lost cause. Um, they preserve remarkably well. In fact, in some respects, they preserve certain materials better than desert sites, although it's not necessarily the way we would uh, accustomed to um, thinking about um, uh, the, the way things are in Egyptian archaeology. Bone, for example, survived remarkably well. This is an intact, well, except for the head, this is an intact uh, equid donkey uh, burial <coughs> site. Right? Being conserved in situ. Turtle shell, turtle, turtle, turtle shell working workshop. Uh, in a, in a, removed. Uh, soil samples, remarkably well preserved. Our uh, archaeobotanist has declared that uh, this is the richest site for environmental uh, remains, plant and seed remains, uh, that she's ever worked on. She's worked at Giza and, uh, and all over the place. There she is. <coughs> Metal, to our surprise, survives. Not perfectly, um, but is remarkably uh, robust in these conditions. Uh, she is uh, <coughs> uh, surrounded by a typical sort of cocoon of corrosion product, um, but perfectly recoverable. And uh, this is one of the categories of object that, uh, in a sense, uh, it survives better on, uh, uh, in ideal conditions on settlement sites than in the, in the desert. So, that was excavation. We got as far in fact as we, we thought we could go, hit the water table, as you do, um, sooner or later, and uh, decided that we, we were not getting enough bang for our bucks. Uh, we, there were other ways of retrieving the information that we wanted. So we extended the coring program uh, beyond the ruin field itself. So close to the atmosphere pyramids, you will right there. <laughs> Um, this is some time ago. Uh, this was in the, uh, 19, yes, the late 1980s. Um, this is all built over now, uh, either by buildings or by the uh, rampaging uh, construction of stud farms and uh, tourist villages uh, and so on. So it's all, it's all uh, more or less beyond us uh, nowadays. We're just grateful that we did, did something in those days. Uh, I'm sure you will, will recognize where this is. This is actually uh, a core through the old lake bed of the Abusir Lake, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, which was used for um, game hunting, bird 
shooting and so on up until the end of the uh, 19th century. And it's still a recognizable um, um, depression, a very flat area. Um, uh, but it's often assumed to be the lake that fed the Abyssinian pyramids. And we think that this is probably not quite right. Um, we think that uh, from the results of the several calls that we did through the lake bed then and subsequently, uh, what we suspect is that the lake only exists, in fact, in the Ptolemaic Roman periods up until maybe Middle Ages. Um, and the, what, we, what we have underneath that is uh, clean Aeolian desert sand uh, lying over, over bedrock. So it's rather difficult, in fact, to understand how this could have operated as a feeder um, uh, lake or reservoir for the uh, Abusir uh, period temples and uh, valley temples. Uh, and this whole business about change of, change of environment, um, uh, if you have a look at uh, structures up on the top on the desert edge now, whether in Abusir or Asir at Saqqara, uh, there's actually, we, we take all this sand for granted, assume it's always been there, uh, but in actual fact, if you, one looks closely at the way that the, the uh, architecture of archaeology uh, 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 is configured, uh, what we find is there's absolutely no evidence for sand accumulation uh, up until sometime in the Old Kingdom, probably the later uh, Old Kingdom. Here, for example, was Dynasty Mastaba, uh, built directly on top of the existing uh, desert surface. Uh, you can't see this anymore because they filled it in, but uh, this was a very useful uh, stratigraphic section created almost accidentally by the uh, excavation of the Unas uh, Causeway, which runs just here. Um, but what you have here is a complex uh, set of uh, uh, depositional uh, episodes, you know, later, later Old Kingdom and Middle Kingdom, sand and demolition debris. Uh, this is almost certainly a mud ramp that leads up along the uh, Unas Causeway, probably to service the uh, New Kingdom tombs, uh, such as Poruhe, Maya, Maya, and so on, uh, being built to the south. And then, this is not a chimney, but a tomb shaft, um, sort of with its lining sticking out here of the late period, and then right on top, uh, um, uh, organic debris thrown out from the Coptic monastery of Jeremias, which just lies over the, over the horizon. So water cores all over the place, across the, in particular, across the part of the valley that lay west of uh, the Metrovina uh, ruin field. And we were increasingly sure that we were finding traces of uh, former Nile channels. Uh, but also, uh, we were tracking, and uh, the Czech uh, team of Atmos here has uh, done us all a huge surface by uh, producing detailed and, and, and High quality um, satellite imagery. Um, but this again is an old uh, uh, aerial picture, a little bit earlier than the one of Metrovina that we saw. Uh, this step <coughs> pyramid is just here. Uh, this outline, dark outline here, is the site of the Ptolemaic Rubastiaeon, and uh, just to the north, the Anubiaeon. But what you see here is uh, that the desert edge, if you like, the sandy um, deposition uh, that uh, we, 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 we have just been talking about stretches much further out into the floodplain uh, than, than is obvious today. And today the floodplain is approximately here. So the Scottish thing too about the fluctuation, about the, the alternation, the changes that have existed over time. Uh, we are accustomed to think of the desert edge is the area between the desert and the sun, uh, and so it is today, uh, but that has changed radically uh, over time. We wanted to uh, test this idea, uh, so we did a small pilot excavation uh, just to the east of the Saqqara Escarpment, and here you can see this sort of veneer of modern soot that's accumulated over the top. There's the uh, sandy surface that would have existed a hundred years ago, say. Uh, to do this, obviously, we have to install dewatering systems. Uh, we heard from Joe about archaeology in the Delta. Um, it comes as no surprise that you do need a dewatering system to work in the Delta, where the water table is often only 20 centimetres down. Um, <coughs> so this uh, applies equally to uh, Nile Valley sediment archaeology. Uh, 
Uh, and with this one, you get to three meters, perhaps four meters um, vertical stratigraphic depth. Uh, and we know from the drill cords that we've done in the region that this is just above layers, levels where we are producing <coughs> early dynastic ceramics and nothing later. So tantalizingly, we were sort of hovering on top of Oak Kingdom and early dynastic uh, 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 occupation uh, in this very westerly uh, location. Back to pyramids and their uh, valley temples, as, as they are uh, conventionally called. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, our cause through the Abusea Lake suggested that this, this was largely a Eolian uh, or susceptible to um, uh, wind blown sands coming in from the desert. Uh, and this then raises the question of what these valley temples actually were. These sandy deposits that we've done calls around and to the east of the Valley Temples, uh, this one at Abu um, uh, uh, indicate as, as clearly as, as possible uh, that these sand episodes lie well below the foundation level of the, the Valley Temples themselves, and not a hint of any uh, 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 water laid deposits uh, in these regions. So, are we in fact do we have to rethink what the configuration of these pyramids was uh, in, in the Old Kingdom? Perhaps they were entirely dry summits. It seems very difficult to understand how, according, as according to uh, Borchardt's uh, reconstruction, uh, the, even the, the highest floods could have come uh, uh, right up to the, to the temples themselves. We wanted to test this further, so uh, we started off with uh, drill cores at the very edge of the, of the desert. Thank you. 